Well, welcome everybody to another session of the Library of Things collab. Uh, I was trying to figure out which session this was. I feel like we've been running for a number of weeks at this point in time. Um, and But I'm excited that you're all continuing to join us on this journey. And for those that are watching the recording, we are happy that you are engaging and getting to utilize this content as well. So today we're going to be talking about governance, uh, kind of getting into a little bit of the nitty gritty of what it takes to run a library of things and um, and the people part of it all, uh, how we work together, um, which can really make or break not only a library of things, but any type of a cooperative, collaborative project. And so we are uh, grateful to have Liana with us once again, Liana Frick, who will be leading us through the session. And I don't have a lot more to say, just going to point out that, um, again, you can find any of us on the shareable staff with our with our pizza emojis at the beginning of our names, pizza being one of those most shareable foods. And we'll be sticking around at the end uh, to after we have a Q&A, in case you want to just continue to dialogue and check in about your projects or ask any questions, uh, let us know if there's ways for you to participate more deeply in this collab. Uh, please let give us that feedback, and we will continue to try to make this as much of a welcoming and uh, supportive and uh, effective space. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Liana. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be back with you again. I feel like I've been working up to this, my most favorite topic, governance. Um, this might seem a little esoteric if you're just getting started. I know some folks are sort of in the incubation phase, um, but thinking about governance from an early stage will make such a difference. And if you've been established forever and you're thinking about how you can make your library of things more sustainable, more accountable, more inclusive, governance is a great place to look to. So we are going to talk today about um, what you're doing now. So help, helping you understand what your governance structure looks like now. Everyone has one, even if it's just you. Um, we're, we're gonna talk about role clarity, which is really the heart of good governance. Um, I'll walk you through some governance models, not all of them. Um, and then we'll have, we're actually gonna have hopefully some time to talk as pairs and do a little thinking out loud together. And then we'll talk about how to start to shift your governance model if that's something you want to do. That's me, this is my, um, legacy of, of co-directors. So the Station North School Library where I work um, oops, has been co-directed since its inception. Um, so for 11 years, we've had shared staff leadership. Um, we have been developing additional ways to share power pretty much constantly for the last 11 years. So I have a little bit of experience. Everyone has different experience, um, but a lot of this draws on our model, which is intentionally um, pretty non-hierarchical, pretty inclusive, um, and pretty radically flat. So all four of our staff members are co-directors of the organization right now. So when you think about governance, it's easy to just think about, I'm gonna use a, a play analogy throughout the day today. It's easy to just think about the main characters, right? The board and the staff. That's how most nonprofits, most organizations, most businesses are governed, right? There's the people who implement day-to-day -day who are paid to do it. And then there's some sort of overseeing body, the board. But you also want to think about your supporting cast. So these are people who are involved in the organization or could be involved in the organization that might have a role in deciding its future. And everything that we're talking about today is, is how the organization moves forward. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a sec. But um, the more you think about what goes into making a successful library of things, the more people you realize maybe have a say. Um, so we also consider our volunteers, our members, our donors and funders, and then the larger community. So the folks who are not involved with the library yet, but who we would like to be, uh, the people who live in the neighborhood where we are, the voters in our city, all these people who you might consider stakeholders. And then you got to think about the setting, right? Where are all of these people interacting? What is the stage set with? Um, so for us, and for a lot of people, those big components are our strategy our strategic plan, right? That influences the decisions that we make, who's involved in them, um, the scope of those decisions, and then how they get implemented. Um, at the heart of everything is our values, which I've brought up before. Um, 
we'll talk about values again in a sec and how important they are. And then our structure, right? So I just mentioned we have four co-directors of staff. Uh, we have a pretty new board. We were fiscally sponsored until last year. So we have a board of eight people. Um, our staff sit on the board as voting members, which is another consideration, right? How do your staff and board interact? Um, and then we have about 1,800 members and about 100 uh, regular program volunteers. So that's our structure, essentially. Those are the defined roles that we have. And the big question for us always is who writes the script, right? Who decides who decides, right? Who's the author of the play? And that can get a little um, mind screwy, like if you start thinking about like, well, who gets to decide who makes the decisions? Um, so if you ever get lost with this, my best recommendation is to start with act one, just start with the first draft, start with a, let's try this for now. Um, governance can seem like a really big, scary official thing, but as long as you know the basic requirements, so like a nonprofit has to have a board chair and a treasurer and then a third person, that's it. That's the legal requirement for your organizational structure. Everything else is up to you. Um, so you can try something, try and act one, see how it goes. All right, let's talk about role clarity. This is where it starts to get real. Um, before we talk about the roles people take, let's talk about what leadership, what governance can mean. These are the three ways that I think about leadership. Um, I am not a, a trained organization development consultant. Um, I've just worked in a lot of pretty like wacky alternative organizations and I've thought about it a lot. So here at the library, uh, the library in Baltimore, we like to think about three things. Uh, three components of governance. One is authority. That's what you might think of as leadership traditionally, right? This is making decisions that affect other people that affect the organization, right? Taking on the responsibility for making the hard choices. But there's also autonomy to consider, right? Who makes decisions that affect their own stuff, right? What kinds of decisions can people make when only they are affected by them or when their, their own work experience is affected by them? So you might think of like, staff getting to decide how they achieve a goal, right? Or librarians at the front desk getting to decide, um, you know, like what's the best way to help this member when they just came in just now, right? So there's autonomy involved in leadership too. And then there's administration and this is the secret one, right? Being a good leader also just kind of means getting stuff done sometimes, right? So who is implementing, who is moving a project forward? Who is responsible for the bottom line of, hey, we decided we're gonna have a yard sale when is the yard sale happening? Put it on the calendar. Um, so there's a lot of administrative labor in governance, in leadership as well. And so thinking about the ways that these three components of leadership are distributed can help you lift up marginalized folks. Um, so for example, our um, education program includes classes for um, people with marginalized gender. So women, non-binary and trans people. And we as staff um, happen to all be women, non-binary and staff and trans, except for one. And our one male staff member, we talk a lot about, um, Chris does the administrative part of leadership. Um, so we have the autonomy and the authority to decide what happens and then Chris implements. And we're leading together, but Chris has, has let those of us who um, have been marginalized traditionally step forward in authority and Chris has taken the administration. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a sec. But some of the big questions, um, and we'll have we'll have some time again for you to discuss with a partner. But when you start thinking about your governance structure, whether it's the one you have now or the one you want to build, some big questions are who is making the decisions, right? And then who has to implement them? And what is the relationship between those two people? Whose voices are the loudest? And who is the most comfortable speaking up? Often this is related to social identity, like gender, race, class. Who has been explicitly empowered to lead versus who is really stepping up to do the work? Sometimes it's not the same person. And who's being affected by choices that they can't influence? Um, so one phrase we use a lot here comes from disability rights organizers from the 1990s. Uh, Nothing about us without us. So don't make any decisions that affect us if we're not in the room to at least see that decision getting made, um, but ideally to be able to influence that decision. Let's talk a little bit about how this looks in practice. This is kind of what a traditional nonprofit looks like, right? The board is in charge. Um, the board represents the American people for a nonprofit. 
and the non the American people own nonprofits. That's how it works. Um, the board oversees an executive director in a traditional model who oversees other staff who oversee volunteers. So it's very top down or left, right, this model. Um, but you can have co-directors, which is, this looks a lot more like what our nonprofit looks like. So we have a board that oversees co-directors and we actually don't have any other staff at the moment, but we have in the past. So we would each oversee other staff um, and volunteers. You can have a member owned nonprofit where the members directly elect the board um, who then oversee the executive director who oversees other people. Um, in this model, the board sort of regenerates itself typically. So people nominate themselves or are nominated as board members and the board votes about who else should be on the board. Starting board for the first time can be a little tricky, right? Because who picks the first board? There's no clear answer, staff usually. Um, you can have a member owned co-op so a lot of traditional um, co-ops like grocery stores operate this way, where there's a pool of members who all um, benefit from the organization. So they all you know, get to buy their groceries there and they elect members to a board. So there's a rotating sort of um, representative body of the members. You can also have worker ownership. Um, so we have some elements of this here at the library. Um, our staff decide like we, get our budget approved by the board and there's a chunk that's for compensation and benefits. And then our staff collectively decide how we're gonna spend that money on compensation and benefits. Um, we have a lot of autonomy, right? So that's an area where the board has authority. They decide how much money can get spent. And then we have autonomy to figure out how that, that money that affects us directly, our salary and benefits, um, how that gets spent. And then we do the work. So we also have the administrative leadership. Um, and in any of these models can use different decision-making sort of modes, right? So here at the tool library, we use consensus, um, which is complicated, but beautiful. Um, to use consensus, the, there are a lot of guides out there. There's a lot of training. It could be something that we talk about in a future session. But the core of any successful consensus-based organization is agreed upon values and goals. Um, so the biggest difference I think between consensus and voting is not that everyone agrees, it's that consensus necessarily has to be made. So you when you disagree with something in a consensus organization, you disagree based on values. You say like, this is in conflict with our values um, or our stated goals. When you vote, you can, you can vote based on values, but typically it's not done that way. Typically a vote is like, I think this is a good idea. I don't think this is a good idea. Um, our representatives in the US, for example, are elected based on how we think they're gonna vote, not necessarily on their adherence to our core values. Um, so I love consensus. It takes time. Um, it, it's a really difficult culture to build, but I, I think it's really worth it. If for no other reason, then it really makes you think about what your values are and what they mean to you. Um, and then there are different kinds of voting models. So you can have a plurality vote, uh, which means that um, more than half, like a certain number, 75%, 60% need to be in favor of a proposal for it to pass. Um, this is our backup. So for our board, if consensus cannot be reached, we can default to a plurality vote um, just to make sure that something moves forward. We never want to do that, but it's an option for us. Because um, really what that means is that some of the people in the room would see, see the organization doing something that feels out of step with our values and get outvoted. That doesn't feel good and it's probably not in the best interest of the organization. Um, and then there's a simple majority vote, right? This is majority rules, more than half the parties are in favor, something goes forward or the reverse. Before I move forward, are there any questions about any of these things? Um, I just sort of breezed through a lot of quote unquote content. Um, because I want to make sure that we have time to discuss and then also um, to look at how how we implement some of this stuff. Any questions before I move forward? And feel free to put them directly in the chat, if you will, or to speak right up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I had a question about your consensus-based decision-making, if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, I don't know. So so like how many people does that involve typically when you're uh, mm -hmm. doing a consensus-based decision? That's a really, really good question. So our board uses consensus. 
and our co-director team uses consensus. So at most we have 12 people. When we have made decisions um, in our sort of more informal years, we had 30 to 40 volunteers who would come together once a month. We had a volunteer meeting and we decided staff as a group. Um, we did not use consensus then um, because it was too large a group and people just, they weren't connected enough with our core values to preclude some of those like, well, I just don't agree with that. Um, not agreeing with that personally doesn't work with consensus. Um, we don't, so we, we, for the most part, try to make our formal organizational decisions with the staff and the board. We're going to talk a little bit more later about how members, volunteers, other folks fit into decision-making, but I will say one of the biggest pitfalls, one of the biggest holes that I see uh, organizations fall into that leads to lack of trust and leadership is a lack of clarity around what someone's role is in making a decision. So it's been really important for us, we'll talk about this um, towards the end of the presentation, to define whether you are being asked for input, whether we just want information from you. So not even your opinion, just like, you know, how many tools typically get lent versus do you think we're lending tools the right way versus how should we lend tools, right? So being asked for information, for input, to be part of making a decision or to make a decision independently are all really different. And so making that clear to people up front, as a volunteer, you will be asked to give input on decisions, but you won't necessarily get to vote on what the decision is, for example. Um, that is something to be really careful about. So that's a long answer to your question. Our board and staff use consensus. Um, in other groups, we're typically not making large scale decisions. Um, but when we do something like when we went, implemented our code of conduct recently, we wanted to get consensus from everyone because that was a really, really big deal. Um, and anyone who didn't respond, we recorded as stood aside, basically, uh, neither yes nor no, they just didn't participate. Any other questions? We will have time at the end, but we are going to do a little reflection. Um, you're going to get paired up with someone who's probably a stranger, and this is an opportunity to get to know someone else in addition. Um, but let's do eight minutes in the breakout room. That'll take us to just about 4.30. Um, and these are your questions, which um, well, I'll also put in the chat. What is your current governance structure? Um, Thank you, Tom. Um, what is important for you to think about in decision making? Um, who is currently not involved in leadership and should they be? So these are the big questions um, for you to consider. At whatever stage you're at, it's always good to check in on your governance model. So what's your current structure, even if it's really informal? Um, what is important to think about in decision making for your organization? And who is currently not involved and should they be? And see a couple of folks can't participate in a breakout, that's okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And one of my team members go here and, is going. Yep, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms. And uh, if for some reason you get in a room and nobody's there, please come back into the main room and we'll get you put into a room where somebody is. And again, these are just gonna be pairs. So you'll be talking just to one other person. Um, so if you are there by yourself, it means that there's another space that you can be. And if you're not running I, because, a library of things, yeah, but, you, yeah. but you are involved in another kind of organization, that's okay. Um, and if you want to stay in the main group, we can just have a discussion about where you're at. All right, I'm going to open those up and we'll see you back in about eight minutes.
And I think you just have to accept the uh, the move to the breakout room. Seeing a lot of people still in our main space. Yeah, I think some folks, I'm just going to like move people who said that they weren't, for sure weren't going to do it. I know Erin is in a room on her own. In room eight. Yeah, John, Kyle, Nima, Rachel. Um, some folks said they That's weren't wrong. able to join a breakout. Yeah. I think everyone has at least one other person in their room. Okay. <laughs> Try it out. See how it goes. So for the folks who are still here in the main um, room with us, I'm curious, what are your governance structures like? Are you just starting out? Do you have an established library? Do you have an organization that's not a library of things? Where are you at? I can share here since I'm not able to join a breakout room. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Hey, awesome. Nina. Okay. Hi. Um. So we we do have an organization outside of Library of Things, but we just started Library of Things. So all these sessions have been very informative, and just hearing from people who have gotten it. Um. But I would say that we have a very formal structure as of for now with our organization, and I'm hoping that it will continue to be that way when we do establish the Library of Things as well. What do you hope will continue about your structure that's working well? I would say the leadership. Uh, we have a pretty solid uh, group of leaders in Take the Initiative. Um, and also the participation. We work with the well, uh, with a really good community that always shows up. So I'm hoping that will also continue through Library of Things outside of what we already do. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, having people who show up, being able to cultivate that level of energy in people um, to come back and to participate and to contribute, that is like a just a piece of human magic. It's really hard to cultivate that on purpose. So hold on to that for sure. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm curious how your library of things is set up, if it's formal, informal, if you have a board, if you have staff. I'm also just really trying to get to know other libraries of things. So I'd love to hear from you. And again, I think uh, there's a lot of people in this group that are still developing their libraries of things, but are involved are in other projects, mm -hmm. right? That could have uh, either similar structures to what you're talking about, or their structures could shift over time. Well, this can also be an Vivek. opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, <laughs> bring I know Vivek. he's here. <laughs> Just joined us from Chicago. Um, so Vivek, we were uh, talking about the ways that governance exists outside of, or that leadership can exist outside of just the board and the staff. Um, and I'm curious about your experience. I know it's been relatively short. Chicago is pretty new, um, but you've grown pretty quickly. And I'm curious what governance leadership looks like, who's involved, um, how are decisions made? Do you vote? Do you use consensus? Um, yeah, this is, it's kind of an evolving process, really. Um, we, one thing that I think Tessa and Jim, who started the library, did really well is establishing that they want other people to take responsibility and that they are willing, you know, there is a standard and a set of expectations, right, that like we need our borrowers and patrons to be treated in such a way. But if you can meet that, and you can help, then any positive change, right, is a good one. And so we started with no board. Um, it was just Tessa, Jim, and a couple of core volunteers. And we would do, you know, we would just talk about it. And it was largely, we saw things very similarly. And so it was functionally consensus for those decisions. Um, but then we did eventually start a board. Uh, we issued Robert's rules completely. We had no interest in doing that. Um, because 
that type of structure can be really stilting. And I apologize for missing the first 20 minutes. So I'm not sure if you've already Sorry. talked about that. Um, I didn't. I talked about voting, but not the full. Robert's Rules of Order is a, a, like a procedural guide for holding meetings that is um, pretty strict. Yeah. And it's, this is the, the whole thing that you've heard about of like, I motion to do this. I second to do this. Okay, we vote. You know, like that kind of thing is is where that's coming from. And it's, I think, from like the 1800s in the UK. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, and... But yeah, I think now we're, it's really interesting because it's, volunteers can have a really big impact. Um, I think especially a lot of li library of things, volunteers are functionally staff. They're the people who know the most of what's going on. They care the most. They're really invested both in the mission and the outcomes for the library. And so not listening to them is at your own peril, right? And same thing with your members. So there's two things I'll point out to make this not super long-winded that we're trying to do. Um, one, we're trying to start a community advisory council. So that is folks within the community that we're operating in, as well as our broader membership. And here in Chicago, we have two um, lending inventories, one specifically for community groups and one for the general public. And we want to be really responsive to their needs. So we're gonna create this semi-paid, I think it won't be paid this year, but the plan is to budget for it. So that people will get paid for a couple meetings a year to give us their opinions and feedback on their experience, even if they're not members. Um, so if they just live in the area and they can tell us what they see as the needs, we can adapt. So that's a big part of trying to outsource the input and leadership, right, of, of an organization. Like they may not have the time to make all the granular decisions, but their opinion is still as extremely valuable, right? And, you know, we want leadership from the communities that we're in, particularly here in Chicago, which is especially segregated um, and really disinvested in some specific ways. Um, and then the second thing that I was gonna point out is we have started holding quarterly, biannually um, at volunteer meetings. And so that's for any volunteer that we have that is specifically talking about volunteering, not uh, anything else, right? We're not saying like, oh, what tasks do we want to do next? We want to figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it so that, and how those align with the tool library's needs to then make sure that they have a positive experience. And that's again, getting their feedback and collaborating with them. So hopefully that was useful. Yeah, that was super helpful. It's just good to get other voices in the room too. Um, but I really appreciated what you said about your volunteers really being the people who know what's going on in the ground um, and are implementing, right? So earlier we talked about authority, autonomy, administration. Um, and it's really important to recognize also what value people can add. Like what level of detail do people understand about your organization and how does that flow up to the big decisions, right? Who are you asking for input? And as folks rejoin us in just a sec here, I always love to see people coming back slowly from breakout rooms. It means they're having good conversations. Um, we're going to talk about no matter what system you choose, how to document in a way that makes everyone feel heard. Okay, everyone back. There they are. Great. Hey, everyone, welcome back. Um, I hope everyone had either some good thinking out loud or maybe even some good discussions. I know that those are always a little too short until they're way too long and then it's really awkward. Um, so regardless of where you are right now or where you're headed, um, actually, sorry, before I move on, we have the time. Does anyone have any gems? Did anyone hear anything from themselves or from someone else that they wanna share with the group? Yeah, I will. Um, see, this is Bill Barberg. And um, I just, we were talking about the, uh, just the opportunity to help rural lower income communities. And I, there's a case study that's just amazing. And they refer to it as the Tupelo miracle. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sign off my phone temporarily uh, and sign on via the computer and put that in the chat. <laughs> but it's a, it's a wonderful story of, of a very struggling 
community that really rose up by working together. And I think it could be a good good story for people to know because it's um, just a good example in the U.S. Um, thank you, Bill. Yeah, the thing about governance is that it keeps getting reinvented. Um, and unless we learn from each other, we're just going to keep spinning that same wheel. Uh, so it's awesome to learn from groups that have done something different and had it work. So thanks in advance for sharing that link. Um, Teddy asks, curious if anyone can speak to the, in my experience, very slow process of consensus-based decisions or shared decision-making, including community and or volunteers. Is anyone using consensus and or including volunteers and community members in big decisions? Is anyone here using consensus-based decision making? Has anyone done it? Yeah, this is Bill. We do a type <laughs> of consensus decision making where we mm -hmm. have people really work through what we call a from to gap. What's the current state? What's the desired state? And just talk through a bunch of contrasting things like today, it's this way. Here's how we want it to be. And as we bring people together, it often clarifies a lot of things that people if they weren't happy about something, it's like, well, how should it be? And then mm -hmm. let's talk about that and let's clarify what needs to be different or what should we you know, be working towards to be different. And we just have a table. What's the current state? What's the desired state? And we do that on a lot of different issues and it works really well. Um, sometimes people are thinking very differently, but sometimes it, it helps them bring together. And sometimes people who are opposing something they're thinking something that's different from what the people really want. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a really uh, valuable technique we've found to be uh, good in many situations for, it's a way of building consensus. That's awesome. Bill, if you have um, a template or an example you can share in Canvas, I'd love to see it too. We're about to do a new strategic plan. I'd love to see that. Kami, Kami, Kami? Kami. Kami. <laughs> I've never said your name out loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I know. Tammy, I saw your hand up before. I that was that was accidental. Um, I was just like trying to like sort of plus one, but um Teddy, yes, I hear and see you. Um I haven't officially worked in consensus recently, but still try to use consensus inspired or informed process. And I think just trying to identify what the blocking concerns are as soon as possible and allowing space for people and definitely feeling safe to articulate what sometimes might feel like uh, things that are silly or controversial. And sometimes it, it can't take place in real time. Um, you just have, like, have to put a pin into it and come back at a later point. That's all. Yeah, no, that's totally true. Yeah, leaving spaciousness for things. Um, there's a couple of things that have made consensus work pretty well for us and in other organizations I've worked for. Um, so just like building less into your agenda, like knowing that if you have a big decision to make, it might take the whole meeting. Um, but if that's a big value of yours, uh, you know, in inclusivity and consensus, and or it's a decision that you like really needs to be durable and people need to get behind and support, it's worth taking the time to do it. Um, some things that have been really helpful for us have been educating people up front about the values thing, right? Like when we raise an objection and consensus, we need to, we have to point to say like, this is in conflict with this value or this stated goal. Um, we also, for like really small decisions um, or even not small ones, like uh, when we elected our officers to the board, we did what we call a round. Um, so you can just get gauge someone's, like the group's um, feeling on something. Let's let's just do a round on this proposal. How are you feeling at the moment? And this is, I'm in favor. I don't need to talk about it more. This is like, I'd like to talk about it more. I'm not sure. And this is like, I'm not feeling great about this decision. We need to make sure that we plan some time to talk. Um, and so doing a quick check-in with the room can be really helpful because often people are just like, yeah, I'm good. It's fine. We don't need to keep talking about this. Um, but leaving room for people to ask all the questions that they have often brings people to consensus. Um, and that is similar to what we call procedural justice. Um, so when someone feels like the process has been fair to them, generally the outcome feels more fair, regardless of what it is. Anything else on consensus? And I, we can totally come back to it too. I'm just like a little time goblin, so I wanna make sure I get through my slides. 
Would you be able to talk quickly about what the process of um, identifying values looked like and mm -hmm. who was involved in that? And yeah. Yeah, that could be a whole hour for sure. Um, it, it really evolved slowly for us as an organization. Um, we did, uh, a, I would call like strategic plan light um, about three years in. And we, at that point, identified our mission, our vision, um, and some organizational values. Um, but that was really just mostly the staff um, and a couple of key volunteers. We have drawn from subsequent strategic planning processes. So um, when I came on staff here about two years ago and started this process, the first thing I did was just go through all of our past stuff, anywhere that we had taken notes on volunteer meetings or strategic planning processes where people are talking about what the organization means to them. Um, and I wrote it all down and then I started to categorize it and lump it and just sort of like make it into broader and broader ideas. Um, and then the, the staff, most of whom were former volunteers. Um, so we all had kind of a lot of institutional memory, came up with a proposed list um, and they were not polished. It was just like a list of things that we could say about the organization. And then we had a volunteer, like an, what we call an all hands meeting, our volunteers and our teachers. Um, and it was the focus of the meeting it was like, we're gonna talk about our values. We did some exercises, um, you know, people sort of like talked about what resonated, what they had questions about, what felt like didn't resonate. Um, and then we as a staff took that feedback back. We did a draft too. We sent it out. We did the same thing. Um, so instead of trying to draft in the moment, we did like an input, refine, input, refine, final version. Any objections? No, we're good. And talk about that in this section, in fact. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump back into slides. And I think we will have time for more chatting as well, which I love. Let's talk about how to shift. Um, it could be a little shift. It could be a big shift. It could be how to get started in creating governance. Um, the first thing, prepare, prepare, prepare. So I talked about this authorship paradox before, um, who gets to decide who decides. This is challenging when you're getting started or when you're doing something like building a new board for the first time, you get stuck in this loop of like, well, our structure is that the board votes in new board members, but we don't have any board members yet. So what do we do? Um, I just talked about this process of draft feedback, draft approval, which has worked really well for us. Um, so often when the staff has to make a decision because that body isn't in place yet, or because it hasn't been clear who makes the decision, we'll say, here's our first step. What do you think? And then people will give feedback and we'll say, okay, here's our second draft. What do you think? And people will give feedback and then we'll say, okay, we think we heard everyone. Here's our proposal, like speak now or forever hold your peace. We'll draft it again if we need to. We'll discuss it again if we need to. But we think we heard you. How does this look? And that's worked really well for getting buy-in from the really large group where some people are like, don't even check their email. Some people have big opinions and they show up to every meeting. Um, so at some point, someone just has to do the admin leadership. And at the beginning, that admin leadership is so important, right? Just getting someone to write it down and say, is this right? I put it in, I put it in writing. Do you agree with my understanding of what's happening? And then specificity is really the soul of good governance planning. Um, the more you can think concretely and consciously and slowly and completely about your decision-making processes, the less you'll have to catch yourself and be like, oh, we did it wrong. Um, and you will. You will do it wrong. Um, so some of it is just, you know, you got to try it and see how it goes. But it's really worth spending time daylighting all the decisions and work that's involved in your organization and then thinking about who does them and what their role is. So here's a little insight into what we've done. Um, and if this is helpful, I can um, post it to Canvas as well. Um, this is just like, it's a little in the weeds, but this is how we've done it. So we have two separate documents um, that are actually in progress right now. We're still working on them. But you'll see on the left, <clears throat> these sort of like definitions of how people are involved in something, right? So authority to decide. This is the group that ultimately makes the decision responsible for accomplishing. Like this is what this person or this body is responsible for getting done. They hold the bottom line for this, getting over that finish line, being completed, being done well. Key contributors are people who um, could sort of check in and out of a project. They could be consulted, they could help a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's not their fault if it doesn't get done. And then who are they evaluated by, right? Like who is determining success? And this was something we kind of 
left vague for a long time. And it turns out many of us have different definitions of success and that has caused some friction. Um, so getting clear about who gets to decide what success looks like and whether you've achieved it is really important, even though it's a little awkward. Um, so our staff, as I mentioned, as a body, right? So like us together, we allocate staff benefits. Um, we decide on our working policies and schedule and we decide on internal collaboration systems. We figure out how, when we're gonna work and the way that we are compensated for it based on our total compensation allowance. We're responsible for executing the strategic plan. Ultimately, it's that's our bottom line that we hold and ensuring operational success, success defined by the board. Um, and cultivating diverse and inclusive leadership is part of that. And then you'll see each staff director and any potential staff manager has very specific roles as well. Um, and so that staff director, while they might hold the bottom line and be responsible for accomplishing the strategic plan, they have authority to decide how to best meet those strategic objectives within their area. Um, and then how they spend the money that accomplishes that. Um, you kind of get the idea here. Any questions about this version? You'll see I have the, the program volunteer box highlighted. That's just where my cursor was. But um, this is autonomy, right? So the authority to, to decide for them is really what they have autonomy over. So they, they get to decide how much they are involved in the organization. Um, they get to pick their own schedule. Um, and they get to figure out the best ways to solve the problems when they're there. They have autonomy to do their job. They're responsible just for accomplishing very discrete tasks, right? So volunteers need to make sure tools get checked in and out, cleaned, members have a good experience, you know, people pay for their membership, that stuff. Um, they're a contributor to determining policies and practices, but those policies and practices are under the authority of the staff director. So that is a line that has been really important for us to clarify, right? That program volunteers, like Vivek said, when folks were in breakout rooms, um, they know best how things should get implemented. But sometimes there are things that a staff director has to decide, like that would be the best way to implement it, but we don't have the money. Or that would be the best way to implement it, but I know that we're not gonna have enough volunteers to do that, something like that. Okay, I also wanna introduce if you haven't seen it before, the idea of a RACI chart. Um, this acronym could be anything. We, we use RACI internally, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Um, so this is sort of the same idea as this chart, but it's instead of talking about um, each individual person, we're starting with the task. So this is just a different way to slice and dice the same thing. So what we have been working on is a massive list of everything that happens here at the library. Literally everything, everything that gets done, every decision, kind of decision that gets made, everything from who takes out the trash to um, who decides how big our expense budget should be, um, everything. And then we're going through and determining who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted and who's informed. So responsible is at the end of um, who is implementing this. So this is um, the administrative leadership. Accountable is the sort of like authority. I guess it's like, a, it's a different framework, but accountable means like at the end of the day, whose job is it to make sure that this got done? Um, who is consulted? So like who whose knowledge do we need in order to do this thing or make this decision? And then who's informed about the work that we've done? So I picked a couple different examples. So selecting new tools for the library. Um, the, the people who really do it are the library committee, but at the end of the day, the staff person in charge of the library is the one that buys them, right? They, they decide like, yes, we're gonna spend the money. No, we're not gonna spend the money. We find out how to do this by asking our active members, right? Like what tools do you want to borrow? And then we tell the greater community when we have acquired new tools, we're like, hey, we have new tools. Maybe you should join the library, right? So that's sort of a workflow and um, the roles for that task. Changing COVID policy is something that um, is, is more internal, right? So the staff leadership team changes the policy, but the co-directors, the, the senior staff are the ones who decide what the policy should be. 
and then the staff really implement it. We update the website. Um, we tell people about it. We are the ones out there being like, hey, we don't require masks anymore. Let's talk about it. The board in this case was just consulted. We decided this was a staff decision to make, but the board had to be like kind of on board with it. So sometimes we talk about another column, which is like who needs to be in consensus about this decision, not just consulted. And then we informed our active members, hey, we've changed our COVID policies. There might be times when the same person or group holds multiple roles. So scheduling volunteer meetings, um, the volunteer manager has to make sure that gets done. And they also get to pick when the meetings happen. Um, but the volunteers need to be both consulted about when they should happen, right? So like, hopefully we can get the most number of volunteers there because it's the best schedule for everyone. And then we tell them, right? The volunteers need to be informed about when the meetings happen. So there's no perfect part. <laughs> there's no perfect model um, or graphic organizer for work planning and role planning, role clarity. But these are two that have worked pretty well for us. So you can either talk about what each, each person or each group gets to do, or you can go task by task and say, like, what is everyone's role in this thing that we're doing in this decision that we're making? Lastly, I know I've said a couple of these already, but in, in addressing governance in a way that is community-centered, equitable, inclusive, all of the things that I think are inherent to libraries of things, right? We don't do anything the way that everything is done, right? Like we are inherently disruptive. We are inherently radical because what we are doing is envisioning a different world where we share resources. Um, and so how do we share power as a resource is just a huge question for us. Um, governance is really important to everything that we're doing. So you have to be patient. You have to listen to feedback. Ego and good governance do not go well together. Um, so if you are vetting new board members or new staff members, keep an eye out for somebody who cares more about their opinion uh, than about the good of the organization. Um, and really screen for people who know how to give and take feedback because consensus, especially co-directorship, shared leadership, you have to be able to be honest with each other. Um, and then be willing to try something imperfect and adjust it as you go. We've been iterating on this for 11 years and we have such a long way to go, but we wouldn't be where we are if we hadn't tried at some point. That's it for me talking. We have about 10 minutes and I know we have some very uh, cool voices in the room. Um, yes, I will share that role definition sheet. Um, yeah, I'm curious if folks have questions, if they have used other models, um, if you wanna to talk to each other about the governance structures that you have, this is such a, I don't know, an organic living topic that I wanted to leave more room for conversation. Mm. Steve, go for it. I'd share that um, at Toolbox Project, we've, um, we've worked on that traditional model, except we've never actually had an executive direct director. I mean, we've never had staff to direct. It's been individual volunteers who are taking the lead on a particular project with approval, with direction, with guidance, et cetera. So just, I mean, I appreciated the uh, rigidity. It shouldn't sound negative. The close lanes, the divisions between all your different paradigms, but that was, mm -hmm. this is what we do. Yeah, totally. And the way that we do it is not necessarily good or better. It's what we have needed. Um, and I will say there is a, a beautiful sort of harmony that can happen where people just get shit done and probably shouldn't swear it's recorded. Um, they get stuff done. They work together well. You know, there isn't conflict. People don't need to be held accountable. But that never lasts forever. Um, and I think a lot of pain, strife, conflict can be avoided by having at least job descriptions. And I think that's almost more important when your staff aren't paid, when you're relying on volunteers. Um, I think it's actually more important to have really clear boundaries for them, right? Because when you're being paid, you're typically being paid for a certain number of hours. And when you're a volunteer, that can wax and wane. You can and I'm speaking from personal experience, like get your feelings hurt and not want to show up as much. You can disagree with how something's going and feel like, well, I'm not getting paid. I'm not in charge. So I guess I'll just be grumpy about it. Um, 
So I would encourage you, even if you don't go into the incredible depth that we are going into right now, um, yeah, do do definitely focus on job descriptions and be upfront with people about what you're expecting from them and what success looks like. Um, I'd love to hear how other libraries have provided opportunities for members to weigh in on decision making, especially folks who aren't super involved as volunteers or on the board, et cetera. Sarah, yes, I want to hear that too. How are your members involved in weighing in, making decisions, informing decisions, offering input, any of that stuff? Uh, I could chime in here. Um, so since pretty early on in in Chicago's history, we have done a member survey. Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we don't collect basically any demographic information from our borrowers. Um, that was a pretty intentional choice made at the beginning that we, I will say, is not uniformly one way, right or wrong, we're reconsidering, but it's a way for us to get anonymized um, demographic data, which is an important in a city that is this segregated. A lot of grants will also ask for it. Um, and so in that survey, we put a lot of other space for feedback. So about how their experience with our software has been, how their experience in the library, what things they want to see changed, what things would excite them. Most recently, we just added a question because you know funding for tool libraries is very hard, asking them what might make them want to donate. Right. And and we phrase it in a way that is meant to be very approachable so that you can say the answer is like, I just can't, you know, we're not. And then we don't, you know, we don't actually record people's information unless they would like to be. I think we've we've had raffles. And so, like, if they want to be entered in the raffle, then they need to submit information. But um, so, yeah, a survey like that in small tool libraries, especially you will find that like your membership cares so much that you will get way higher response rates than anyone else in the broader world doing something like this. Like getting a 10% rate is high in this kind of survey. And I think we were pushing 20 or 30% um, without incentives. So, you know, I think it's very doable, especially if you create a good environment. Um, so that is one way um, to, to hear directly from your membership. I think also having a way for whoever's running the desk because that is often where these conversations happen to communicate that to a broader audience. So here we keep a captain's log, which is just what it sounds like. At the end of the day, anything weird that happened or anything we want to note, uh, our librarians can put it in there, um, which is especially helpful when we we're all volunteers. Um, and that it, you may not be able to make really swift, exact changes based on that information, but you can start to no notice patterns and trends and things like that. I will say, if you ask someone for feedback, you have to be ready to make change. Um, so anything that goes on a survey, you have to be willing to accept what people tell you and then also take action in that area. <laughs> or else they're gonna be like, I'm not doing any more surveys because nothing changes. Ask me how I know. Anyone else, how are you getting uh, feedback input decisions from members? Is anyone doing this? I asked the question, but I can share the one thing that we have been doing that has seemed useful so far. Uh, we started doing a quarterly member meeting that is arranged around like a specific topic. And we have only done one so far, but we got a bunch of people that came out uh, to give us feedback about our new workshop series. Um, and we held it at a coffee shop slash bar so that it was not at the tool library, <laughs> which is kind of dark and <laughs> uninviting. Um, so hopefully that'll keep working for us. It's just every like seasonally um, four times a year. Love that. We've done a couple, um, we've done a couple of members meetings. We've done, I think three. Um, and they have been largely informational. Um, so we've been trying to increase transparency. Uh, like when I came on board, when we did our new budget for the first time, we were like, hey, here's our budget. Here's what we're spending what your money on. <laughs> um, but we've really struggled with uh, finding meaningful ways for people to give input on things that don't feel small, but also where we really want member input that aren't just which tools should we have. Um, so yeah, so, uh, Sarah, I might connect with you later on Canvas um, or elsewhere just to find out what kinds of topics um, other than the workshop series you've interacted with your members. And I love the idea of doing it somewhere else. Yeah. 
So I'm just noticing the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to say, I'm just Mm -hmm. noticing the time. And we've got a couple of things we want to just uh, share and get some feedback on right at the end. So the first one is, as we mentioned last week, we're planning on doing some kind of continuing monthly sessions for the rest of this year after this collab is over at the end of, of May. And so last week, we asked you to weigh in on a couple of topics related to fundraising specific, and um, they were pretty balanced responses for all of the all of the things. Everyone said, Uh-oh. we want more information <laughs> about all of the things. So we looked at them and you know one of them was around doing uh, crowdfunding. Another one was about in-person events. There was another one about writing grants and there was another one about kind of finding uh, grants and funding sources. And we realized that there could be probably two of those topics each could be clumped in two sessions. So I don't say that to suggest that just vote for everything and we will make all of it happen. Please do. We got another poll, as you can see up on the screen. Please do choose maybe your top one or maximum two things that uh, you'd be interested in us going deeper in further. And that survey should now be popping up on your screens right now. I will also say that Candace is just about to put in, uh, or maybe I just missed it. Oh, just it, Candace has just put in right now our uh, kind of annual or rather weekly weekly session uh, feedback survey. And we do really appreciate those of you that have spent a few moments at the end of each one of these sessions, adding some feedback for them. Um, So please, if you would go ahead and do that as well this week. Again, there's a link for that in the chat. I mean, that was my housekeeping. Uh, As as we do every time, we'll we'll be having the, the video recording, the transcript, the chat recording, uh, all of all of and also the presentation um, uh, PowerPoint itself will all be going up on Canvas uh, by the end of the week. So please go ahead and find that information there. And as we also mentioned, we are going to be keeping the room open for another fifteen minutes so we can continue the dialogue. But for those of you that have to jump off, just wanted to make sure we took a quick pause to um, fill out the survey. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of answers coming in. And we do have this community governance as a clear lead right now, 14 out of 18 folks um, with worker ownership models being uh, second behind that. So if you haven't put that in, please do. And as Candace just put in the chat, if you've got any questions about the collab, upcoming sessions, anything that can uh, help you kind of plug in a little bit more deeply, please get in touch with her. And we'll be back next week with another session as we are off to do for the next few weeks. I think we're about two thirds of the way through. So we've got, we'll be, we'll we've got about, I think four more sessions to go. Do we have any it other sounds, questions? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I am curious. I know that, um, especially because community engagement was the number one topic in our poll, what kinds of community engagement are you struggling with? Is it your members? Is it people outside of the library? What does community engagement mean to you and what are you interested in learning about it? Community governance, sorry, not community engagement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I mean, we're still in very early days over here, but like one of the things that we keep having a conversation with about in in our team is like, how do we structure it so that it's not a service that is brought to the community, but rather something the community feels that they it's theirs you know it's something that they're directing and that they're uh, a part of a tool for them to use rather than a service being brought to them Mm -hmm. yeah totally we talk a lot about being like the stewards of community resources but that the resources come from and go back to community members that we're here to facilitate sharing not to run their lives sometimes people really just want you to be in charge of stuff too so (laughs) Yeah, anyone else? Um, what does community governance done well look like to you? you have other stuff you want to talk about? I mean, I'm a professional facilitator. I'm fine to just be quiet, but. Well, I'm sorry to keep jumping in here, but yeah, this is a topic that I, I mean, we talk a lot about 
in my team and that I care a lot about. And, you know, like the idea of like a membership run model has always seemed interesting to me. Uh, I wonder like in everybody else's experience, why that, like, I get why you would not exactly want to do that. It's always autocracy would be like the easiest way to do anything. Right. But nobody wants to do that. It doesn't really align with everybody's values when they do this work. Sure. But you know, you don't want to make it dilute power all the way out to every member because that gets messy as we've discussed. So I, I guess that's, mm -hmm. is that the reason that we, that model is so rarely used? Go ahead, Jason. Oh, I was just going to say, I think um, if, to your point earlier, Liana, about if you ask people for input, are you going to be ready to make changes? Um, I think that's the most important thing I would want to learn more about in terms of community governance is once we bring everybody into the room and we're all hearing opinions, um, you know, how do we incorporate those folks into like developing the processes to actually get what they want to see out of the organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Dig and I'd share we're at a stage where we get a lot of people that want to help out, want to be volunteers among our membership, um, but beyond that, and it's hard to get people to the next level. You know, folks want to just show up and help out, at, you know, presenting it to them as, look, you can help guide the ship. It's like, no, no, I just want to row. <laughs> but, but that's also valid, right? I totally. Think that, I think when you're creating a volunteer structure and you're creating a system for feedback, like letting people find their lane, I. I think the, um, oh God, I already lost it, I apologize. I think, but I'll, to echo Leanna from earlier, Jason, I think the thing is again about leaving room. You have to plan to have the resources in time, money and otherwise and headspace to actually give to the thing. You know, and you can set expectations just again, echoing her from job expectations, but like when you're coming into a feedback session, it's like, this is what we've got capacity for, right? Like, you know where you're at and like you can hear everything and then you can be clear about what you're able to actually act on. Um, I think that that, it matters a lot. And I think you will, you'll know if you're doing it right or wrong pretty quickly because you'll lose people in an instant or people will stick around for year after year after year because they trust you and they believe in the process that's created. Um, I do want to highlight one other thing too when it comes to feedback specifically that I think people get a lot really wrong, which is the funnel in. So you're like, well, we solicited feedback. We asked, but only five people responded. And that sometimes is the case. You're going to have communities where people don't engage with you and they don't actually want to put in the, the legwork to follow through, but really being critical about what your funnel is. Um, because if you're not actually reaching the people and breaking down the barriers it takes for them to give you feedback, you're not really doing it. And, and so you're just paying lip service to the notion of community engagement. And I think a lot of places do that. I'm not speaking to you specifically, just, um, but just broadly, you know, it's, it's really easy to just be like, you know, we have good values and we care about things and we want to do this and then not realize that if you don't put in the proper legwork at the beginning, you might as well, it honestly will do more harm than good because you will disenfranchise people and they will be really annoyed. Yeah. And I think that's, um, I, I mentioned that one of one of the director's roles is cultivating diverse leadership. Um, and for us, it's it's not just because diverse people deserve to be in leadership, right? People of color, trans people, women, queer people, disabled people deserve to be in leadership. But also, we all have blind spots, for lack of a better term, right? And so when you have somebody with a marginalized identity in a position of decision making in a, a position of authority where they're making decisions on behalf of other people they're going to be thinking about different stuff than someone who's been in power their whole life that you know someone who like me like aligns with dominant culture pretty well um and so you know also thinking about the diversity of the people who are making decisions in itself is important because those decisions are going to be different Even things and I think like, the transparency. How do we ask for feedback? <laughs> yeah, and I was just saying the transparency around what that feedback looks like, right? Like I just had the poll up, and I realized, oh, I never closed it. Oh, because I didn't close it, I didn't share it with everybody. So not everybody else saw it. You just heard me regurgitate what I saw there, but you didn't get to see it yourself. 
And I think that's also important. Uh, and that, that touches into um, Jason, your question a little bit is that when people give their, when the people give their feedback, all they know is what they've shared. And if they're not seeing what they've shared happening or their suggestions happening uh, in that vacuum, they're like, oh, they didn't listen to me, right? Like, why did I do this? But if you're able to see like, hey, there was all of these different ideas and can see how some there was, you know, 75% of the people all kind of had ideas that clumped around this. I can see that they're taking action on that now. That doesn't mean they won't take action on the thing that I suggested later, but you can see that there, it's the feedback is part of a larger kind of system. Uh, and I think that can also help a lot because when these things are just going to the black box, then nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a part of administrative leadership. That's really important. Like good admin can really go a long way for transparency. <laughs> I'll share it to something else that Vivek was talking about earlier. Um, you know, we have really, we've struggled with the same thing that every community-led, volunteer-led organization struggles with, which is like, most people do want to show up in row and that's great. And we, um, we have this one volunteer, Noah, who's been with us since the beginning. Um, he's been here 10 of our 11 years and he shows up so consistently to a shift and he has such big opinions. Um, and every time we ask him to join a committee, he's like, nope, I'm here to be a librarian, I'm here to be a librarian, I'm here to be a librarian. But then he has really big opinions, right? And so eventually I had to have a conversation with Noah and just be like, Noah, you can't keep telling us your opinions if you don't wanna do it in the way that we have provided. So there's also like, you have to meet people where they're at and we have to have you know clear invitations to engage in additional responsibility, additional leadership to like step into those roles and you have to remind people that they're there, right? Because if if people like Noah show up and they just complain about the COVID policy and they don't want to be part of the committee, then like, Noah, come on, you know, like, so it's also about having conversations with people, especially when you shift your governance to, to help them recognize that the culture is changing and help them recognize that the structures are different now. Um, because I've found that in, in longstanding organizations, often the culture won't shift until people realize that it's shifting. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Jan, you put episystemic justice and episystemic sovereignty in the chat. And those are new terms for me. Would you mind explaining a little bit more about what they mean? I know I could Google them, but you're here. Maybe I'll Google them. Does anyone else know what they mean? Yeah, that was new to me as well. Maybe we'll integrate them in our next session. Right to know and the right to make meaning from that knowledge. Okay, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, I feel like we can, we can call it here and thank you all for continuing to this conversation with us, uh, you know, from week to week, but also after hours in this session and next week we will be discussing communication and marketing cool. and branding and how to get these ideas, uh, you know, and, and these opportunities that libraries of things provide out to the communities that uh, need them. Thanks everyone for coming out. I appreciate you letting me make you participate.
Iya. All right. And then there were five. Oh, I'm going to stop this recording.